Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. What interferes with your happiness? What are some things standing in the way of being the best version of you? For a lot of people, life, your past, and sometimes your current situation can cause roadblocks in your life. Mental health is incredibly important, and so many, including myself, can benefit from talking to a professional and working to dismantle those roadblocks. That's why I'm excited to talk to you guys about BetterHelp. BetterHelp knows no two people are the same and will help to assess your personal needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. These incredibly convenient appointments are in a safe and completely private online environment, and you can start chatting with your new therapist in under 24 hours. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling. You can message with your counselor at any time and get a timely response, plus schedule weekly video or phone sessions, which means no driving to an office, no waiting rooms, and no awkward small talk. Just meaningful sessions with experts who specialize in things like depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, trauma, family conflict, LGBTQ matters, grief, and so much more. There is truly someone there for everyone. And BetterHelp is committed to finding your perfect match. Which means if you and your counselor don't mesh for whatever reason, they make it easy and free to seek someone new if needed. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling. And with financial aid available and access worldwide, they truly make it easy for anyone to seek the help they need. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at BetterHelp.com slash Morning Cup. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. There were two more murders 15 miles away. When police arrived, they found the telephones and electricity lines. We have a weird homicide. The scene described by one investigator is reminiscent of a weird... Cup of murder. Insurance policies are a double-edged sword. On one hand, a payout after a loved one's death can help the surviving family in ways they never knew they needed. Things like the funeral cost or the settling of debts. On the other hand, the promise of a large settlement can bring out the most evil parts of a person. On March 24th, 1873, a woman was hanged for the crimes she committed in the name of insurance money and comfortable living. So if you like your coffee hot but your bones chilled, sit back and start your day with a morning cup of murder. Mary Ann Robson, born October 31st, 1832, moved with her family to the County Durham village of Merton when she was eight years old, where she excelled as a student and was considered an innocent girl with a good disposition and a put-together appearance. Unfortunately, tragedy struck her family soon after the move, when her father fell 150 feet down a mine shaft to his death. His body delivered to the family in a sack with the stamp Property of South Hetton Coal Company on the side. Not only was his death a tragic loss for the family, but the Robsons were living in a miner's cottage owned by the coal company. So with her father's death and her family's imminent eviction, Mary Ann's mother did what she felt was necessary to help her family and married another miner in 1843. Time passed, Mary Ann reached her teenage years, and at 16, left her family home to work as a nurse inside of the home of Edward Potter in a nearby village. And once his kids all reached boarding school age three years later, she moved back into her stepfather's home and trained to become a dressmaker. Shortly after returning home, Mary Ann met and married a man named William Mowbray, a laborer at the Newcastle-upon-Tyne Register's office, and the newlyweds moved to southwest England. Now, here's where Mary's story and poor record-keeping gets both sad and difficult to prove. According to later reports, Mary Ann and William had four or five children while living in the county Durham, but because the laws about such matters weren't enforced until 1874, none were registered and only one birth was recorded, a daughter named Margaret Jane, born in 1856. So it's truly impossible to know if Mary Ann had more than one child, and if she did, what happened to each of them. But eventually the couple moved back to Northeast England, where William got a job as a fireman on a steam vessel, and together, the pair had another daughter in 1958. Unfortunately, her birth was followed by Margaret Jane's death just two years later. A year after Margaret's death, the pair had another daughter, whom they also named Margaret Jane, and in 1863, had a son who died about a year after from gastric fever. Poor Mary, it seemed, couldn't catch a break, and just a year after losing her son, lost William to an unknown intestinal disorder. Now, before you start to feel too bad for Mary Ann Cotton, she, like so many women in these stories, had a life insurance policy on not just William, but all of her children as well. So when William died, she got about 35 pounds and a little over two pounds for her son, which is close to 3,600 pounds in today's money. With some money in her pocket and raising her children on her own, Mary Ann moved to Seaham Harbor in County Durham, where Margaret Jane II, now only three and a half years old, died from typhus fever. This meant that out of the nine children she birthed, only one was still alive and well. So she sent that last girl, Isabella, to live with her mother while she moved back to Sunderland, where she began working at an infirmary, where she met a patient and future husband, George Ward. She married George on August 28, 1865, about seven months after her first husband died, and George lived with Mary Ann for just over a year before succumbing to his long illness on October 20, 1866. Despite his underlying health concerns, the attending doctor found the swiftness of his death suspicious. But before anyone could raise an alarm, Mary Ann collected her insurance money and went off looking for a new man. James Robinson, a shipwright and recent widower living in Sunderland, hired Mary Ann to take care of the house and the children his late wife had left behind. Just a month after she began working, James's baby, John Robinson, 
died of gastric fever. And devastated, he turned to his housekeeper for comfort, after which she found out she was with child. Shortly after finding out she was pregnant, Mary Ann's mother contracted hepatitis and she left to return to County Durham to care for her. At first, the 54-year-old started to recover, but after a few days, started to complain about severe stomach pain. And in the spring of 1867, after being in the care of her daughter for only nine days, Mary Ann's mother perished and she, along with her daughter Isabella, went back to the Robinsons' household where Isabella would meet her fate along with two of James Robinson's children. All three were buried between the last week of April and the 1st of May in 1867, and Mary Ann received a small insurance payout for Isabella's death. The following August, Mary Ann and James were married, and their daughter, Margaret Isabella, was born that November. She grew ill and died in February of 1868, and a second child, a boy, was born in June of 1869. Mary Ann, in a short period of time, had a large number of people die while in her presence. So when she kept insisting her new husband insure his life, he was a little apprehensive not to mention the hefty debt she had racked up behind his back, and that she was forcing his older children to pawn off household items. Realizing she was no good, James kicked her out and kept custody of their son, George. Desperate and on the streets, her friend Margaret Cotton introduced Mary Ann to her brother, Frederick, a recent widower who lost two of his four children. Margaret had been acting as a caregiver for the remaining children, but after falling ill and dying in March of 1870, Mary Ann was left to comfort the grieving man and step in as a substitute mother while she became pregnant for the 12th time with Frederick Cotton's baby. The pair were bigamously married in September of 1870 as she had not been properly divorced from James, and soon their son Robert was born. Not long after giving birth, Mary Ann found out that a former lover of hers, Joseph Natras, was living about 30 miles away in the village of West Auckland and that he was no longer a married man. So she rekindled that romance, convinced the Cotton family to move closer to him, and like the others, Frederick died, Mary Ann cashed out, Joseph Natras moved in, and the pair got pregnant with her 13th child. Next to fall victim to this black widow was Frederick Jr., who, along with his brother Charles, was still in the custody of his new stepmother, followed shortly by the infant Robert. Joseph Natras then fell ill with the same gastric fever that seemed to plague everyone in Mary's life, and died just after revising his will and naming Mary Ann as its benefactor. The last man standing was Frederick's other son, Charles Edward Cotton, who Mary Ann had taken out a life insurance policy on while she was biding her time. But it was his murder and her mouth that would finally be her undoing. Mary Ann was asked by a parish official to help nurse a woman ill with the smallpox back to health. And while she did, she complained about how Charles was in the way and asked the official if he could be committed to a workhouse. He explained that she would have to accompany him. And she responded, I won't be troubled long. He'll go like all the rest of the cottons. Five days later, Charles was dead. Mary Ann was at the insurance office and the official, who also served as the assistant coroner in town, was suspicious. Despite the fact that the jury inquiry determined that the death was natural, newspapers were abuzz with the story of the Black Widow, who, from what the investigators can figure, killed as many as 21 people to collect insurance money. The rumors were enough for the investigations to continue, and after an exhumation, Mary Ann Cotton was charged with Charles's murder, and the trial would be delayed so she could give birth to her baby girl, Margaret Edith Quick Manning Cotton. When the trial did begin, the defense claimed that Charles died from accidentally inhaling arsenic found in the wallpaper of the Cotton home, and there was some discrepancies about the type of arsenic sold and found in his system. Despite this, the jury deliberated for just 90 minutes and returned with a guilty verdict. In the end, on March 24, 1873, Mary Ann Cotton was hanged for only one of the murders she committed, and up until the day she died, she was adamant that she was an innocent woman. Thank you for joining me in my morning cup of murder. Please join me again tomorrow to hear what terrible thing happened on March 25th. Don't forget to rate and subscribe and let me know how you like it. If you want to help support the podcast, there's always Patreon or just sharing it with your true crime obsessed friends. And remember, stay safe.